Welkom, dames en heren, bij deze sessie, de laatste van de middag. Maar we hebben ook nog een mooi avondprogramma natuurlijk. Uh, naast me staat uh, Drazen Janko, Jankovic. Uh, hij gaat een verhaal vertellen. Getting started with Pally. Voor, uh, ja, eigenlijk over... Oh, we gaan hem in het Engels doen, hè? Ik begin weer in het Nederlands. Neem niet kwalijk. Mag beide. <laughs> Ik uh, begin steeds in het Nederlands, terwijl die sessies al in het Engels zijn. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, next to me is my uh, uh, esteemed colleague, Drazen Jankovic. He's going to give uh, a talk about a tool for automated accessibility testing called Pally, uh, which is uh, written a bit cryptically, I uh, suppose. Mm -hmm. um, well, accessibility, why is it important? Um, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of uh, experts uh, the last couple of weeks on accessibility, and uh, one of them um, <coughs> Uh, told me this, uh, this quote that uh, stuck with me a little bit, and she said, um, buildings have to be accessible, and there's a lot of attention to that, to make sure they have ramps, they have elevators, and all that. Why isn't the same true for, uh, for digital means, for a website or, or an app? And um, uh, there's a lot of uh, tools to be used. You can use checklists, uh, you can uh, get uh, users with uh, uh, different disabilities involved to do some testing. Of, of course, you can also do some automated testing, what uh, Drazen is going to talk about. So Drazen is one of our, um, at Society Netherlands, one of our uh, experts on the field of accessibility, uh, a UXer uh, in, uh, in the broadest sense of the world, but specific knowledge and expertise in expertise, ex accessibility. I've had uh, the pleasure of working with him on a project, so I know his, uh, <laughs> his uh, expertise is on a, quite a high level. Uh, a few uh, maintenance uh, message messages. Um, if you have any questions here in the uh, in the house or people online, please ask them uh, right away. Just stick up your hand and put them in the chat, and uh, Drazen will get uh, get back to you. Uh, for the people that are walk uh, watching online, just put them in the chat, and I'll keep an eye on it and make sure that uh, Drazen will uh, will uh, spend some time time on it. This year, for the first time, it's possible to actually rate the, the presentations and the talks. So feel free to go on the platform and uh, either rate and or give feedback on the, on the speaker. So uh, good for Drazen as a speaker, good for Society as a uh, uh, host for this uh, event to get some feedback on it. And is that it? I think that is it. Okay, without further ado, Drazen Jankovic, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. I only accept five-star ratings, everything below. Mm. Not sure if I'll read that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll, uh, quick agenda. It uh, makes absolutely no sense. I just put things down for fun. But uh, a little bit about me. I'm a full-stack developer at SOGT. I am specialized mostly in accessibility for the last 10 years. Um, my passion for accessibility came from the fact that I used to be hospitalized for roughly three months, and the only thing that I had that connected me to the outside world was a PlayStation 3 with a controller. And if you've ever tried to browse the website using only four buttons, you realize how dire the need is for proper accessibility with either websites but also devices. Uh, as a hobby, I make cosplay, armor, and props, and I tend to then visit children's hospitals and you know, entertain the kids. Usually as something from Pokemon. Most often a bad guy that they can then beat up. It's fun. Uh, so yeah, what's accessibility? Well, the most common abbreviation that you will find online is A11Y, or Ally, or Ally, or it's pronounced in different ways, and the community is still not out whether that itself is actually an accessible term, because it does not adhere to the uh, standards for how to do abbreviations. So there's an issue there, but in general, what it comes down to is it's the quality of being easy to obtain, use, or understand. So whether that is a website, an app, a game, or even a door handle, accessibility is all about how can we make something easy for everybody to use. And the main question that you then always get is, well, why should I care about accessibility? I'm not colorblind, I'm not disabled or anything. Two billion people on this planet are, and they need some form of accessibility features, either on your website or on the product that, that you create. So the question is then, out of the 7.4 billion potential customers, do you really want to isolate 
two billion of them immediately. And that's why you should kind of get into accessibility uh, when it comes to that. One of the easiest tests that you've probably seen everywhere online, this is called an Ishihara test. And actually, let's do it with a group of people here. On the left image, what do we see? Circle, star, square. Yeah? And on the right one? A lot of colors. All right, cool. Well, this actually proves one thing. One in seven men has color blindness out of all of us here. Only I can read that the, there's the word no right here, which means I have color blindness. <laughs> because this is a reverse test. It flips around how you normally do these tests. So for me, all of these brown and orange dots here actually form one beige line spelling out no. Because <laughs> that's how my eyes work in this case. The other one, everybody can see that one. It doesn't matter what type of color blinds you have. It's usually used as a default test just to show how these tests work. Uh, so how can we then help people that have issues like color and blindness? And when it comes to online, we often adhere to the rules of WCAG which is basically a set of rules um, that describe when does something adhere to the, uh, well, when the, it's a standard that sets a rule how to do the standards. Perfect sentence, no. It's a set of rules that it's tended to improve the quality of your experience online. It's made to, um, why am I losing my words here? It's so simple. <laughs> I've written this. Uh, yeah, just improve the quality of any experience that you have online, whether that's a game, a website, even some movies like subtitles, that they also adhere to it. Now, one of the things when it comes to testing all of this, the WCAG has a list of roughly 500 rules. Uh, I know most of them by heart, but there's like rule 4.171-FF sub, it's like, I don't know. Like, there, there's a lot of these small sub rules that nobody can remember all of them. So what we then do is we use automation to help us with testing those types of rules. We use either Axe or Lighthouse, which are the two most common rules, um, tools. But one of the problems with them is that they only test on small parts of the website, or they grab everything, but then give you only one result back. And the problem then is like, well, is my entire page wrong? Is there just somewhere a small issue wrong? How do we test that? So Pally was created just for situations like that, where you can test from small components all the way to an entire site or even a flow. Uh, make sure that your forms don't just look good, but people actually can go through them in the correct order. And today, we'll be looking at two of the tools that Pally provides, Pally itself and the dashboard, because I hate looking at um, screens that only show me a bit of code and nothing else. The other two tools that they have is the web service and the CI, which is exactly the little codes that are very hard to read. The web service basically provides your developers with the opportunity to make their own dashboard in any way you like, so not just with the way that the dashboard is provided here. And the CI basically gives you a command line interface that you can then connect to your build uh, to your builds, whether that's in Azure or Jenkins or whatever you use, connect it there, and you'll get an output that will allow you to block a uh, release of code, for instance, if something is wrong. So it's fairly simple to install. Uh, for the developer, Sundras, npm, install global Pally, and then you run it by typing in the Pally and the URL. And that's it. That's, I could end this presentation right now. This is how you install Pally. The downside of this, though, is, yeah, this is the output. Uh, maybe somebody likes reading this. I don't, personally, because if I want to go to, for instance, what is this error, 414111F77? I don't know. I, it says here that it's a duplicate ID, but is that the F77 error? Is that something else? So there's no easy way of actually going to what's causing this issue. So we can end this immediately here and go like, this works for our developers. And others will say, no, we want something more beautiful around it. 
And that's what the entire dashboard comes into. So whether you use the web service to make your own dashboard, or if you use the predefined dashboard, that's what we're going to take a look into today. Now, one of the issues with installing a dashboard is there's some dependencies on it. In this case, you need MongoDB. Uh, if you're making your own dashboard, you can use any database you want. Uh, just provide the correct information for it. And we'll be running Puppeteer, which is basically we'll be running a Chrome browser automated so that it runs the test for us, acting like it's a Chrome browser. Uh, if you're on Debian or Ubuntu, you need those two libraries ex as well, Libness and libconfig24. Mostly, otherwise, Puppeteer doesn't work for you. So again, we need to install some extra stuff. Clone the dashboard from GitHub. Go into the folder, type in npm install, and you're done. Uh, final configuration that's needed. Again, a lot of this works directly out of the box. But if your database is somewhere remote, keep an eye for that. Like, where is the database? What's the host? And at what port is it running? And what you'll get is the dashboard. And I'm just going to switch over to the dashboard, because I already have it running here. So I've already put some websites in, uh, mostly because I've done this presentation prior uh, for a different group. So we already have some websites in. And what we can then see here is, for instance, my own website here is running at AAA, which is an old website of mine. That's why there's so many errors. But also, we can see, like, oh, well, new.nl, oh, they're doing great. Only one error, which is fairly easy to fix. But how do you actually get to this point? Because normally, as soon as you start, what you see is only this button here, add new URL, and nothing else. So when you click on it, you can add any website. Any website that you want to check? Your own company? Or are we like, no, nah, skip that one? <laughs> All right, I saw people downstairs walking with NS signs, so let's do NS. Yeah. Provided a URL. And then there's this list here. So there's a list of standards that you want to check them against. Section 508 is a very specific United States rule set on accessibility. Uh, the WCAG 2A, AA, and AAA are all different standards that you want to check against. A is, for instance, one of the lightest. You can skip most of the contrast things. Uh, most of your images will immediately qualify. But if you go AAA, then it's like, is everything described perfectly? Is everything the correct size? Is there a minimum size, a maximum size? It will check out. It will check for all of those. So we'll just grab the default here, which is the double A, and then some technical things like timeout. How long should it wait before testing? Uh, should it wait in general? But then there's also disk, task actions. Now, like I said before, uh, a lot of companies already have software running to help them with automation, for instance, Axe or Lighthouse. So what Pally does great is that you can run those same runners alongside it and provide it as an action here. So I can now say, run Axe to do this test over there, but then also click on the Login button to log me in. And that's the greatest thing about Pally. You can combine your testing streets that you already have, combine them into one package and one dashboard and you will get all of your results in one. So for instance, did I just, OK. Uh, for instance, you could do your actions here. Like it says, click on element login button. Uh, provide a username, for instance. For the testers that like to spoof cookies and headers, spoof your cookie and header. Make sure that everything works as you want it. Do you want to hide certain elements? For instance, uh, if a website has an ad banner, Hide the ad banners, provide that information to it. Are we just going to flat out say, no, 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 we know that's a wrong thing on our website. So you know, let's not check that rule. Let's just skip that rule. And that's it. You can even add your own extra rules here. Uh, sorry, URL. 
Uh, if you want to add your own rules, we'll come to that later on. But if I now click Add URL, well, NS has been added. It will check the next time the Pally runs. Now, you can wait for your integrations to kick off or for the 30 minutes uh, cron job to kick it off, if whichever happens faster. Or you can just do run Pally and then in the console here, which is this one here, we'll actually see that it's fetching from the NS website. It's crawling through it and doing its actions. And on here, what you then see is your overview for the website that we just added. So it will say, well, eight errors. It says the exact same thing that we saw previous in the little uh, console, but now it's way more easy to find, for instance, show details with possible solutions on how to fix that. It will take you to, to the correct page, explaining exactly what went wrong and, what the exam um, and how to fix certain types of codes. And this is the uh, bigger advantage here. While Axe and uh, Lighthouse will only say what went wrong in your general page or in just a component, if you are testing on component-based, often you will not get a possible solution on how to fix your error. And that means more time spent on, well, we first need to find out what is the exact error number. Then you go to the WCAG page, which will provide first a whole list of documentation on what is wrong and what the default standard should be, and all sorts of extra information that's not really necessary. And here it's like, well, this is the excerpt of the exact solution. So please go there and take a look there. Uh, it will show you all of the places where it went wrong, providing a clickable link to the exact location. So if it's a hidden div, it will actually show the hidden divs as well. And that, it will do that for all of your errors, for instance, hey, this one has a button name issue, uh, how to use form controls and make sure that they're all correctly done. And, and it will do the same thing for warnings. Now, most warnings you can actually ignore. The, it's basically you're passing it, but you know if something goes a little bit wrong, you're in the error side. So fix them if you can, but it's not really mega important to do now. And when it comes to notices, this is actually a whole list of uh, you did this correct, or we couldn't really test this one out yet because of the limitations within uh, either your website or within the testing software. But it will provide all of the details on how, how we, would you manually test it if something is wrong. Yeah. No. It covers basically every, so the question was, does this cover only the color blindness aspect or anything? No, I should not touch this cable. <laughs> it covers basically every, uh, if I do edit task. So I told it to use the standard WCAG AA. So it will cover all 500 rules on the section of AA. So it, it will give you warnings and notifications, hey, Triple A is so close to meet, or you're breaking triple A, but not double A. But it will only give errors that are breaking. So you could set up your Jenkins, for instance, to stop the production uh, on double A. And it will check everything from if you have videos on your website, it will make sure that there's subtitles on them. Uh, if it cannot do that automatically, it will give you a warning, but it, then it will be like an active warning. You have to check this manually, because we cannot reach it. Uh, so, yeah, it grabs all of the rules. And if you use the web service, then it's really up to your own developers. Like, how much do you want to get out of it? Because then they have full freedom on how to make these dashboards. Now, if we'll go to the dashboard here, NS is, has been added. We see the same things as in the other one. Oh, this one. So like I said a bit a moment ago, there are some pitfalls with automated testing. Uh, depending on where you are in what country, there's 37 laws that, re that are all about accessibility that WCAG will either cover or not. And it's kind of difficult to figure out which ones are covered and which ones aren't. So 
uh, always check out the WCAG page them, uh, yourself because they have a list like this, which is basically find your own country and all of the laws that are included. Now, to go through some of these laws, for instance, the Disability Discrimination Act of Australia, fully covered. If you use WCAG, you don't have to do anything else in Australia. In the, that, in the Netherlands, we have Wetgeving Digitale Toegankelijkheid. Uh, that one is a bit iffy. Some of the rules are fully supported by WCAG, up to AAA, but then some of the laws within uh, Digitale Toegankelijkheid say, we actually do this better than the AAA. So, or what you consider in WCAG as double A is for us considered single A, or triple A is considered double A. So you have to check out those yourself manually to make sure that you are still compliant. Because if you go to a uh, accessibility auditor and you're like, well, all our tests say we are approved, they will say, mm, yeah, they're approved for WCAG, but not for the Dutch law. And if you're operating in the Netherlands, you need to operate within that law. Same for the United States. And the United States have a bunch of weird laws when it comes to accessibility. For instance, the Air Carrier Access Act of 1986. It's fully supported by WCAG, but what would be your guess on why aircraft <laughs> need to be accessible digitally? At first, most people come to the conclusion, well, pilots have the screens, those screens have interfaces, the interfaces... No, it's a little screen that you have in the back for passengers. They have buttons that you can press, and that's why they need to be accessible. And if, you, if those buttons are not accessible on your website, you're actually breaking an air carrier law and not so much a normal accessibility law. So things like that are built in, and a lot of these uh, you would have to check yourself. Now, as I showed, there's a whole drop-down, like there was, for instance, section uh, 508. Um, you can make your own rules for that. So if you know that your country has certain laws, you can add your own rule set and have it tested as well. Or you can just make a superseding of the WCAG with your own rules in it. For instance, um, when we did it for uh, DSV, where I, uh, who were a client of ours, I, I added manual rules to it to be tested, just so that we don't have to always manually test those few extra rules. Now, one of the major pitfalls within automated accessibility tests, let's say we have a button with a beautiful world hello in it, has a nice blue background. Now, one of the things in CSS that you can do is you can change the opacity of a button and you can make it transparent. Well, the automated test will know, hey, that's a transparent button. I can ignore it, because if it's made so transparent that it's not visible, then it should count as not visible. The problem is there are multiple ways in CSS to make something transparent. And one of the ways is unrecognizable to automated tests. So while that one is fully OK, in the AAA standard, it's fine. If we run this code through any of the testers, they'll say it's fine. You can read hello. It's there. I mean, it's on a blue background that's fully set to zero opacity, but it's set in such a way that the code doesn't actually tell, it, tell the uh, automation software that it is invisible but because it's using an alpha layer, and alpha layers cannot be read. So for us, it's fully invisible, but for the test, yeah, it's there. It's perfect. White letters on blue. Nothing wrong with that. So where to learn more? Well, there's, of course, the WCAG website itself. If you want to learn more about the rules, uh, about how to implement them, all of the possible solutions that we just saw in the dashboard, they are all described there. If you want to learn more about Pali, it's on their GitHub. Uh, it's nicely done, fairly easy to use. If you want to learn more about accessibility, Randy is sitting over there. <laughs> Randy has a podcast uh, coming out. It's a six-part podcast with Toegankelijkheid uh, by the Overheid. And it's together with Digitale uh, Toegankelijkheid van de Overheid, if I'm correct. That's the URL. Just go and watch it or listen to it because it's a podcast. I don't know how modern you are. And coincidentally, this week is 
Shall I go back for pictures? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Coincidentally, this week is also in the Netherlands Week van Toegankelijkheid. Uh, so a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of things happening online and offline as well uh, regarding accessibility. That's the website for it, Week van Digitale Toegankelijkheid. Uh, upcoming is Gebruiker Centraal on Thursday and the Rotterdam Centraal. They're organizing a letter relay, if I understood correctly, which is basically they'll have people that have certain uh, slight mental disabilities and they will have them read government letters to see, do we actually understand what's being said here? Because people for often forget that language is also part of the rule set. Any questions? How fast did I rush through this? Oh, no. Any questions? <laughs> any questions from the house? Thank you, Drazen. Yeah. Any questions here? No. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of questions actually. If uh, yeah. no one else is going, so um, Drazen, you know a lot more about this than I do. So uh, if I say I something incorrect, please. <laughs> if I say something that's not true, please please correct me. Mm. But. Um, with, with the automated testing, you talked a little bit about the limits. You gave a good example of, of uh, mm -hmm. how it is limited. If you would use this to, uh, uh, if you would uh, use Pali to do some automated uh, accessibility testing, would you dare to give a percentage of how much of the uh, how ex how you how much of the accessibility can you actually test with an automated uh, system? So it really depends on what you want to test. If you're testing it um, based on visual things, then I'd say you, you're around 60, 65%. Like most of the simple things like uh, color blindness or legibility, you can do. Uh, but like I showed with certain buttons and things like that, where there's some slight interactivity, I'd rather manually test those or have somebody just go over it. But when, you're, when it comes to testing out flows, for instance, like how the login flow you can test out with Pally, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I would trust those probably up to 95% of the time. Um, oh, wow. If your forms are done correctly, uh, so like good semantic HTML, and if you're just using any JavaScript framework, but you're throwing out events correctly, so like a commit event or a submit and things like that, then any automated piece of software will pick up on those correctly as well. Uh, but when it, when it comes to pure graphics, there, there's too much interactivity that can happen. So I would always do a manual run on those uh, personally. Hmm. Because often, currently everybody's working in design systems. So everybody has their own button styling and so on and so on. And they test out just those components. But once you start, giving them to people to use, then they'll go like, well, I like this red background, and I like this red button, bam, perfect. That's when you get issues. And that's why some manual testing is needed. Things like contrast errors, automated software will pick up for you as well. Mm -hmm. But it's always good for graphical issues, always good to check out yourself. OK, OK. Uh, so and you also spoke a little bit about uh the different legislations in different parts mm. of the world and how they uh, coincide with uh, the WCAG. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't it be better if in the Netherlands or the European Union, I'm, I'm just dropping a bomb here, maybe it's not a good idea, but I want to, like to have your take on it. Wouldn't it be better if in the Netherlands or in the European Union there would be a law to have some automated testing in place for any website that exceeds a number of users or f a company that's exceeds a certain uh, profit or something like that? Uh, to make it a law to test, well, there's already a law coming. Uh, for most governments, it has been active since 15th of September two years ago. And that's a law just for the government, right? I mean, yeah. like a more general sense. The general ones, uh, the next law is coming 15th of September next year, which is basically going to be if you are a first or direct partner of a government, for instance, banking, website, hospital, and so on, you also have to uh, apply accessibility features up to AA standard, I believe, and you get two years to fix that. And then after that, uh, they'll be making the general law for everyone, basically. But 
it's going to be difficult uh, because there's so many websites. And of course, there's going to be always issues with, well, although my website operates in the Netherlands, it's actually hosted outside. Mm -hmm. So I'm applying their laws. So yeah, if I put my website somewhere like uh, Tanzania, uh, yeah, sure. WCAG single A is more than enough for them. Mm. So how, how will you then control that? Uh, and we've all often seen that people will try to find somewhere in a foreign country a solution just to dodge taxes. So why wouldn't they dodge things that can give them a fine as well? <laughs> wow, that's a grim outlook. I mean, there's improvement coming. <laughs> okay, but that's thanks. why it's like mostly up to developers and designers. Like, uh, if your manager tells you to make a website, uh, it's up to you to make it better. You don't have to do the minimal viable one. <laughs> true, true. Anyone else here? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, in general, I recommend this. And if you have already something running, um, the entire GitHub is filled with how to install all of the runners with the Pali together. So that you basically have Pali as a um, oversight or like a master over all of the other runners. So you don't have to check different sources for all of your tests, but you can check it on one page. So that's why I would recommend Pali uh, in combination with the others. Like you don't have to run them. I, it, it can do most of the things on its own. But if you already have an X set up, why delete it? Just use it and integrate it in this one. Just run them together. It's possible. So. Oh, you can just start with this, yeah. The, the best thing about this one is that it's independent of what framework you're running in. Uh, if you're running Axe, it will play nice with things like Angular and React or Vue. But if something new comes up, you know, it's never a thing. This one runs on top of your final product, so not so much directly on the source. So that way you, you're checking the output, not what the input is. So it doesn't matter what framework you're using behind it, 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 it doesn't even see it. So. You, if you run a manual test after all of the warnings, yes. Because I, I would still then check the warnings to make sure that it's not saying we couldn't test this. Uh, because if it cannot test, then you will think that you have the uh, certificate. But an auditor will say, you never checked this. And we've had that in the past. We did all of our tests, for instance, with Axe. Axe told us, hey, everything runs perfectly. You are even AAA certified if you would go to a certification. We went over there, and uh, we had to pay another 10000 for a new test. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, the tests aren't cheap. And we got back, I believe, 12 A4 pages of what was wrong with the website. They went hard on every single rule. Uh, so yeah, And Axe was like, no, it's fine. But then when you actually look further in, it's actually it's fine for the things we could test. They never give you the warning for the things they couldn't test. Mm. So that's a slight issue. <laughs> so for actual certification, you still need uh, humans. Uh, yeah, I would always do a manual test. Yeah, But also to get it uh, uh, certified. Oh, yeah. The, for certifications, they always do manual tests yeah. anyway. So. OK, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here. Uh, also, the people who are uh, watching online. A um, few reminders, you can still rate these, uh, these sessions or give feedback, so please, uh, please do that if you're willing. If you want to talk about social media about uh, this event, you can use hashtag QXDay2021. And um, yeah, the next session is uh, uh, a session downstairs um, with basically everybody there. It's about quality engineering strat strategy boosts your IT delivery. It's downstairs in the Pesserij. For the people that are here, they can go downstairs. The people online can just click on the right session they want to uh, watch. Uh, Drazen, thank you so much yep. for your time no and expertise. Thank you very much. Huh?